we're going to scripture to begin our service today, or our, our message today, I should say, is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. When Yeshua came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And the Apostles reply, they say, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Yeshua asked them, well, what about you? Who do you say I am? This is the portion of the service where Mary Simmons needs to be sitting right here. This is this would be very helpful for Mary to be. Because she always would hate when I would do this, when I would be open up a message with a, an apology of, you know, I wish I could have, I would have done better in some way or another. Philip, don't apologize. I've got to say I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but it's partly because I had to get up so early this morning. I mean, gosh, I'm not used to getting up early. <laughs> getting alarms are not natural. Have you ever noticed that you're not supposed to? You're supposed to wake up when you wake up. You're not supposed to be rung up or asleep or whatever. I don't, you know, it's it, it's sort of one of the things I've learned by being a Novant uh, chaplain for the last uh, little over a year is that when they, it's sort of different. It's like when they have a meeting at eight o'clock. It's at eight o'clock. It's not at 8.01 or 8.02. <laughs> if you come at 8.02, you're late. So I don't really like it, but it's sort of, it's what we do. You know, one place I remember having to wake up real early a long time ago was is, well, in the holy city of Jerusalem. Oh, I had to stay there. When I was in Jerusalem, I stayed a few weeks in Jerusalem. I, I, I stayed in three different places. The first was the Arizona Hostel which is the wildest, craziest hostel in the world. People dance on the tables with M16s <laughs> on their back and stuff. It is crazy. Uh, I think they closed it down. Um, in the, <laughs> it was probably for the best. <clears throat> the second place was a yeshiva, which is sort of a Jewish seminary, which was a very lovely place, but pretty strict on you know when you had to be back and everything like that. And, and the last place I stayed at was a, a super rundown hotel called the Petra Hotel. It's a little hotel in the old city of Jerusalem and it is it literally looks like it's from 1923. And it probably is. And all the, all the, it literally, like the same stuff, the same wood paneling and the green carpets and stuff like that. And it could be really swanky if they had done it, if they had sort of kept up the carpets or whatever, but it's the same carpet. <laughs> and so it's, it's dingy and, and nasty and there's stains and the wood has a little bit of mildew on it. It's, it's one of those places. There's really nothing redeeming about it. It's probably closed down as well, but... The only great thing is it had this amazing view. It had this big glass along one of the floors there. You could just, I guess, a little dining room. And, and you could see it out and you could see the Dome of the Rock, the Golden Mosque there, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is silver, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and the Wailing Wall. It was all right there, right at that view. It was the most amazing view. Well... As I said, this hotel was pretty terrible. It was pretty, the only people who would go there are very, very poor backpackers. And, uh, well, mostly the people were there, Russian immigrants. And they were coming to this country, that country, Israel, and they, that was the only place they could afford. And I remember when I got there, and what do you do sort of late in the evening where there was sort of this common area there and everybody, and what do the people do? They play chess. And so I was playing chess with this Russian master, and I think he let me win one time. It was the greatest victory of my life. And he, he told me, he said, you know what? You need to wake up for the sunrise because it's really beautiful. I mean, if you think this is beautiful now, wait until the sunrise. 
And so, you know me, so I was there a few days. And so the, I never really did it. You know, I just, it would always sort of like, I'd always wake up and it was like 9.30 or whatever. And I'd always sort of say the sun was already up. And I remember the last night that I was there in Jerusalem, I woke up early. I must have been thirsty or something like that. And it was like 4.30 in the morning. Ever been up that early? Mm. Not natural. Not natural. <laughs> and I had a choice to make. I had a choice. I had to choose between going back to sleep or waiting. And I guess the sunrise was close to like 6 in the morning or something like that. Or... And I had to make that choice. And I, did, I got up. And I remember going into that big room there that they had that big view there and it was all dark and shadowy. And you know, it was, it was, there was a beauty to it in itself. But, and it's so amazing as you're waiting for the sunrise, how Im imperceptible it is as it starts to slowly lighten and lighten lighten and even get brighter and brighter and then across over the Mount of Olives you can see the Mount of Olives or you can see, see it come up and when the first rays of sun come through across that mountain and hits those glow those those domes it in light it just enlightens the sky and I remember as I was just waiting, you know, it took about over an hour to do this. There were more and more people that gathered there. Just in, in, We were all silent. Nobody talked. And we witnessed this, this miracle. Of something that touched my heart. It was just such a beautiful and holy experience. And it was at that moment that I knew Jerusalem was truly the center of the world. I guess I know, have you, have, I'm just saying this sort of facetiously in a way, but have you ever seen a medieval map? Yeah. Where, where, what's at the middle of it? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, right. <laughs> That's the way they conceived of it for thousands of years is that Jerusalem for Christians and Jews was the center of the world. And it was the place of the Bible and of Jesus and the apostles and, and David and Solomon. And that's the way they conceived of it. Not just figuratively, not just spiritually, but actually literally. It was the center of the navel of the earth. And now I'm going to say something controversial here. It, when I say literally the center, it, it was. Because up until the scientific world or our scientific understanding or pre, uh, what is that, a printing press, right? Before that, the vast majority of the world's people thought the earth was flat. Before we got this idea around that the earth was round, most people saw the earth as flat. And they saw it as a disc, a disc, like a record. Not a record, but like a disc. Well, like a record. Well, okay, anyway. <laughs> Right. Ollie, that's a CD for you. Like <laughs> <laughs> a CD. And at, the, and at the center of the record of the disc was the center of the earth. I don't know, what is, the, what is that in the record called? The little, the little hole in the middle? What's Holes. it called? <laughs> it's, a, it's a what? It's a hole. It's a hole. I thought I had a name, like a record name. Like a, in, it's a spindle hole it's, because it goes on a spindle. Okay, there you go. Spindle. Okay, so at the, that was it at the very middle. And, and, and basically, it was there at the middle. It, there was some point that was truly the middle of the earth. And it was surrounded by a bowl. And had, the bowl had all the stuff in it that people 
that things happened on. And that's how generally people conceived of the universe as a disk with a bowl, with a center. And now this is true. This is a very consistent thing from the vast majority of cultures. And of course they change it to where their center is. So maybe it's Jerusalem or Mecca or the Bodhi tree or the Cherokee have a sacred forest in the Smokies that is the center, the navel of the earth. The, the Greeks had Delphi mm -hmm. was their center. It wasn't really until the Greeks in the third century BC did they finally figured out that the earth was not a disc, but round. And it was people like Aristotle and folks like that who were able to measure that and figure that out. So this flat earth, the flat earth was replaced by a perfectly round one. And this round earth was surrounded by beautiful, amazing crystal spheres that you could see through. Mm -hmm. And these spheres would have a planet on them or the stars or uh, different celestial bodies. And you had a variety of spheres. You could have seven spheres or nine or 12 or a, multi, a lot of spheres. And they're all beautiful and they worked perfectly. And at the very top, at the beyond the last sphere, wherever that sphere was, there was God. Or gods. Or whatever it is that was beyond it all, you had the final rung. And that's because of that. That's why we always say, where's, where's God? Well, I got to talk to the guy upstairs. Oops, here. Not in camera range. <laughs> Right? Because that's why we point that direction is because at the last celestial sphere, there lies God, maybe the angels. I think the angels are in a different sphere. Now, one of these Greeks had a crazy idea. One guy, a guy named As Aristarchus of Samos, and he had the crazy idea that for where he just looked at the, the solar eclipses and things like that. And he said, you know, I think the sun is actually at the center of things. I don't know about the spheres, but I think the, the sun is at the center. But he was just a crazy philosopher. Nobody listened to him. It was just insane. And so for the next 2,000 years, it was basically perfect earth surrounded by beautiful celestial spheres. Maybe 1,800 years or whatever. It was until Copernicus, we've all heard of that guy, in 1543, gave us his solar-centered universe. Now, the idea was so controversial that he waited till he was dying to publish it. And even then, the idea didn't really, idea didn't really take off. It was only about 67 years later that Galileo, with his telescope, looked at Jupiter and he saw things were revolving around Jupiter. Now, if it was just me and I'm a big believer in celestial spheres, I would just say, well, I guess there's more celestial spheres. Great. <laughs> but for whatever reason, Galileo, by seeing other things revolve that wasn't the Earth, it just cracked the whole thing. And the whole idea, the whole universe system came crashing down. And so it wasn't this earth with celestial spheres. It was rather, it was the sun that was the center of it all. And so it remained. For hundreds of years, the sun was the center. In 1750, there was a guy named Thomas Wright who got the idea that these stars that we see, they weren't just sort of random. They were actually in a flat plane called the Milky Way. That thing, well, I just sort of named it after that. And that the entire Milky Way, this whole galaxy, revolved around the sun. All of it. All of it revolved. The Milky Way, the galaxy, all of the universe revolved around the sun. 
Now there was a guy, a crazy guy called Immanuel Kant, a philosopher, an ethics philosopher. You know, you ever had to had to study him. I'm sorry, yeah. uh, moral imperative and such. Uh, but he said that uh, rather he thought that some of the things out there in the sky, but specifically the fuzzy sort of stuff, uh, were actually independent universes that had their own suns that things revolved around and were completely separate from our own. But again, he's just a philosopher. He doesn't know anything. He's, don't listen to him. He's an ideas man, not science. And this idea that the, pretty much the universe revolved around the sun survived until the 20th century. Until the early part of the 20th century, most people believed that the entire universe revolved around the sun. The sun was the center of the universe. It was actually debated at the great debate. Have you guys talked about the great debate here? Has that been one of the messages? I don't know. The great debate, which was on April 26th at 1920, were two great astronomers and directors of observatories, a guy named Herbert, Herbert Curtis and Harlow Shapley, presented their arguments as the forefront exponents of their ideas. And they were arguing specifically at what they looked into the sky and they saw what were fuzzy nebulae, nebulae. And what were those exactly? Now, Shapley was a young gun. He's called a young gun because he's in his 30s, but he's actually really a shy guy, didn't really like to talk. And he was the head of the Harvard Observatory. And he was expert understander of globular clusters. It's a hard word to say. I don't know if you've ever done that. Globular clusters. And he knew his idea was that the more globs you had, the closer to the center of things you would be. And because the sun wasn't around a lot of globs, it's not the center, but rather on the edge. And the shape, he was really good with math. He accurately sort of predicted the size of the galaxy and how many stars. And he figured that these fuzzy globs out there, they were just other nebulae. I mean, the, the nebulae were just, flat, they were just globs, just far away. Now, Curtis was older. He was the wise old professor. He wasn't very old. He was my, he's like 48. But he was <laughs> old. <laughs> And he was totally wrong about the size of the galaxy. He thought it was much smaller. And, and he still thought the galaxy revolved around the sun, which was what most people would have believed. But he thought that these fuzzy nebulae were actually very far away. And they were actually different universes or galaxies. And he presented his arguments and his measurements. And Now, okay, so at the great debate, nobody won the great debate. They didn't vote afterward, you know, after they presented their arguments. There wasn't like American Idol or, you know, the, nobody got voted off the island. The problem was they couldn't really do measures. They couldn't measure these things at that time. But within five years, a guy named Edwin Hubble, anybody ever heard of him? Oh. Yeah. Anybody have to measure the redshift? <laughs> he did his measurements of these nebulae and he found that they were very, very, very far away. Millions of light years away. So vast that there's no way that they could be within our galaxy. Now, Shapley responded to this. He said, this is junk science. Don't listen to him. And Hubble wrote him a letter explaining exactly his measurements and exactly why he was correct. And shapely, as he was reading this letter, he's talking to a friend, he's reading this letter. And at the end of the letter, he says, this letter destroys my universe. Now, Edwin Hubble, who was the, gosh, he was the foremost, I'll say the foremost astronomer of his days, was pressured when he, came to these realizations and things. He's like, you, well, where is the center? What's the center of it all? What is it? Is all wrong? What is, you know? And he refused. He would not name a center. And here's what he wrote. 
I gotta find this. Hopefully. Uh oh, it's not gonna be pretty if this doesn't happen. Oh, here we go. I know this is not good TV. <laughs> Here's what he said. He said, this is about five years after the Great Debate. If we see the nebulae all receding from our position in space, then every other observer, no matter where he or she may be located, will see the nebulae all receding from his position. However, the assumption is adopted. Therefore, must be no favored, there, there must be no favored location in the universe, no center, no boundary. All the universe must be alike. The universe must be pretty much alike everywhere and in all directions. Gosh, isn't that amazing? That in a thousand years, we went from a flat disk to crystal spheres, to an all-powerful sun, to a small star, and a sea of countless stars, and an infinity of endless space within billions or trillions of galaxies that more or less are exactly the same expanding away from one another eternally. And it makes me wonder, is, 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 that a, is that a blessing to have that knowledge? Or was I actually better in my own ignorance thinking that Jerusalem was the center? That the universe revolved around the earth? That I knew my place in the world, my importance. And yet in some ways it reminds me that in Quakerism we believe that all places are sacred. That there's not one place more sacred than another. It is everywhere within our hearts. All right, okay, so I know we've been, this is tough. I've been going on, here we got to lighten things up a little bit. Okay. All right, if there was a Quaker center, if there was a Quaker center of the universe, where would it be? I want to hear, let me have it. What? London. London? Who said London, by the way? Okay, why would you say London? What was that? Well, that's where, like, the big, like, that's where, like, they are, yeah. I that's we don't have one, but like I, we don't. But yeah, okay, one. I like it. If we had to choose one, it would probably be there or Philadelphia. Or Philadelphia. That was my, another one of mine. Mm -hmm. What, Marcy? What did you say? Pendle Hill. Pendle Hill, the one, the place that like College Retreat Center in Philadelphia. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, how many Pendle Hills are there, David? Two. Two. That's where it's off. Yeah. The uh, other one. The other one. Yeah. The one that's the big log, big hill. That, what did uh, I've been by on the train? You've been by on the train. That's right. I almost did a story about me climbing Pendle Hill. Uh, I almost did. But I thought, gosh, it's going to be 700 minutes long. This is crazy. Um, okay, Pendle Hill. Anybody else? Any other? Like any centers of? Anybody? Swarthmore Hall. Swarthmore Hall. That's the one I was looking for, actually. So that sounds better. Uh, Swarthmore Hall. I'll take it. Um, all right, here we go to number six. You know, the day George Fox met Margaret Fell, the very day they met, he walked 20 miles. Or we walked more than 20 miles. We don't know. He usually walked about 12 miles a day, but he walked double what he normally walked. Apparently, he had to get somewhere fast. And presumably, we don't know why he was going, but presumably where he had to go was to get to the Fell's house. Because Judge Fell and Margaret had, were, had a reputation for welcoming itinerant uh, crazy preachers. <laughs> we had a reputation. Maybe not a good one, but that was the reputation. And when he first got there, he did not meet Margaret Fell or Judge Fell because a judge was on the circuit. He was in Wales. He wasn't anywhere around. And uh, Margaret was gone, so she wasn't there. 
But he did meet her preacher, a guy named Reverend Lampet, who was there, I guess, looking for Margaret as well. And so they, they had sort of a little get together together, and I don't know what they did, but they talked, and it was the kind of relationship that wasn't really all that great. <laughs> you know, but at least, at least initially they could tolerate one another. And they saw in the other something. Now, for the most part, Lampet's big complaint about Fox was that he was a ranter. <laughs> and he was, didn't follow the rules. He didn't have any discipline. And Fox's main complaint about Lampet was that he was a ranter. <laughs> and that he followed the rules a little too much. Well, by the time Margaret Fell came back, the Lampet was gone, but George Fox had already messed up the household. He had already, we don't know what exactly he did. It was probably, I'm going to carry my own luggage kind of thing or something. Who knows? But it already had made things a little uncomfortable. Now, Margaret Fell was interested in what George Fox had to say because she had heard about the children of the light. Now, you do know, obviously, we haven't even talked about this before, is that, that they call themselves children of the light. They didn't call themselves Quakers or even friends. Children of the light. So she was very interested in these people she had already heard about. And so she talked to them, and they talked a good bit. And she invited him to go to church the next day. It was a market day, and she was going to go to church. And what he said to her is he didn't know if he could go. He didn't know if he could go because... The thing about George, he probably didn't, he didn't really, he didn't like steeples. There was something about a steeple that would keep George away. And I guess he thought it was idolatrous or whatever. But he, anyway, we're lucky because the church she went to did not have a steeple. It had a little tower, but no steeple. But he didn't go in. He didn't go in. He listened from outside. Oh, hold on. <laughs> I guess I should do that. And he was listening inside. And there were the, th the crazy thing, you know, they went through the service, and they, the thing that motivated him to come in was the singing. Sort of interesting. And maybe it was so good that he was like, yeah, I like the singing here. It was a little like what we sang just a little bit ago. Thank you, Dave. But no, it wasn't the, the good singing. It was the bad singing. And it wasn't really the tone of the voices. They were Anglicans. They probably sang pretty good. But it was what they were singing about. Because, see, they were singing about joy. And they were singing about hope. And they were singing about love. But these were people that didn't have any hope that didn't have any love, that didn't have any joy. And so he was motivated to go in and speak. Now there's debate exactly how this happened, but probably he asked Reverend Lampet if he could speak, and he said, sure, speak. Now there's the tradition that when he did this, he probably went up to the pulpit, but there's the tradition he, he stood up on a pew and I wanted to stand up on my pew today to really show what I'm talking about, but there's no pew here, really, so I don't want to step, I don't want to, yeah. And you'd be off camera. I'd be off camera, no <laughs> doubt. And I don't know, I feel like this is a, this is a throne. I can't step on a throne. Um, and so he asked to speak, and he began to speak. And he began to say these words, and it was sort of a long speech, but this is one of the things he said. He said, you will say Christ, say, Christ saith this, and the apostle saith that. But what can thou say? Aren't thou a child of the light? Hasn't thou walked in the light? Isn't thou what speakest? Isn't it inwardly from God? Now, these people of love, these people of joy, these people of grace, started to say, shut up! 
We don't want to hear it. He's crazy. Shut him up. These people of love began to shout like that. And a ward and a constable came up and said, came up to George and was like, okay, we got to move it along, friend. And George was sort of familiar with us. And Margaret Fell stood up on her pew. And she stared the constable down. And the minister said, let him speak. And he kept speaking. If you know George Fox, he loved to speak. So I'm not going to stop it. But Margaret Fell didn't hear any of it. She was sobbing. She was crying. She was absolutely devastated. Because all the people that she had seen, these people that she loved and cared for, for decades, and they knew nothing of God. And here's what she said. She said, his words opened me and wounded my heart. I saw clearly that we have all been wrong. And I sat down in the pew and cried bitterly, crying in my spirit to the Lord, we are all thieves. We are all thieves. We have stolen words from the inspired writings, the scriptures of others, but we know nothing of this inspiration in ourselves. You know, Rachel and I, I got to put her on the daughter. I was going to do this. I love you, Rachel. I was going to say, okay, I'm sorry. I'm doing this, but I'm doing this too. And this is, we were talking about this. Oops. We were talking about this, about what is it about these experiences when the world seems to shatter that brings sadness and not joy. What is it about that? Why? You know, because that's the thing is some of these realizations we get, some of the things we realize, they shatter our universes. And all the comfort of, of just being, having the same stuff support us over and over again, to have those poles snapped destroys a part of ourselves. And one of the other things she, she mentioned was that inevitably when these Universes are destroyed, conflict arises. People want to hold these universes together. They want to glue them together with super glue, these beautiful crystal spheres. But they're just going to crack and break apart. Now, truly, here's what I'm going to say. This message is not about the universe or uh, George, George, it's, it's about continuing revelation. That God is still talking to us. You know, Quakers are one of the very few denominations that have really sort of ascribed this to themselves, that God is continuing to reveal itself to us, that we have not figured it all out, that we're not so smart. I don't know, that came out wrong. But that we haven't all the universe, that we're still learning it. It's really, there's not many faiths that really, it's us, the Mormons, and the Pentecostals. So that's our company. It takes humility to say that you haven't figured it all out. And yet, and really it is true, especially when you think of it in some terms of how the spiritual growth has occurred just in the, the years that, that Quakers have been around. I mean, when George Fox was preaching in the 1650s and you ask a thousand people whether slavery was wrong, a thousand out of a thousand would say, hey, it's in the Bible. It's part of the deal. You know, it's in the Bible. It's, it seems to do it. Paul says, be a be. 
A thousand is, hey, it's fine. And now if you ask that same question, a thousand people, is slavery right or wrong? Well, a thousand of it, a thousand would say, no way. It's wrong. Something important to Margaret Fell, the equality of, of women, the spiritual and political equality of women. The power for a woman to stand on her pew and say, let him speak. Or say her own words. If you ask a thousand out of a thousand, when Margaret Fell was around, should women have political rights? A thousand out of a thousand people, probably even the women. Th no. No. And yet if you ask that same question today to a thousand people, a thousand people, you would... Well, maybe you wouldn't get a thousand, but you get nine hundred and ninety. So you'd get it; it'd be high. This should be a thousand. <clears throat> There's growth occurring in our spirit, and you see it all throughout the many of the very fundamental understandings we have, whether it be peace or less violence or simplicity or sustainability. You see the evolution of spirit. I'm going to tell you the worst thing about Quaker preachers. The very worst thing. One, they talk too long. <laughs> Case in point. But the worst thing about us is we talk about the past. We're in love with the past. We talk about George Fox this and Margaret Fell that and William Penn and John Woolman. You know, there were thousands upon thousands of Quakers that have lived between George Fox and us. Don't they ever get a mention? Don't they have something to teach us? We say George Fox says this and Margaret Fell says that. What can we say? What are our words? Aren't we children of the light? No, maybe we're not. Are we thieves? Have we taken these words of George Fox and Margaret Fell and all these people, we've taken their words, but have we put them in our heart? What are our words? What canst thou say? It's as important now as ever to ask that question. What can I say? I'm going to leave you with this query. Query. Something Quakers sometimes do. What is the center of our universe? 